You're listening to Errol Parker and Clancy Overall, editors of the Batuta Advocate on Desert Rock FM. Well, welcome back to the Batuta Advocate radio show, recording live here in downtown Batuta, home of the brave, free from COVID-19 at this point. Borders will reopen with down south when I think 95% vaccination rate is met, so... We can we can only hope yep. for that. Yep, uh, I don't think that day will ever come in this great state, Clancy. <laughs> it certainly won't help with the vaccine hesitancy we're seeing in Central Queensland. Hopefully, we can we can speed it up. Maybe a couple cash payments, or again, free tickets to a sporting event, sporting event, Powderfinger concert. That might do the job. But uh, you know, it, for the sake of Australia, we do hope that everyone can lift because there are still people that. They're living a life that we don't want to be living. Poor people of Melbourne have been locked down. Some people are, uh, oh, well, how many days now? 285. Uh, oh, I'd be almost 1,000 in Melbourne. <laughs> there you go. And, and one of those poor Victorians is joining us today, coming live from uh, Australia's most European city, is uh, the famous and treasured Australian author, Andy Griffiths. Thank you for joining us today. That's my pleasure. Like, what else have I got to do anyway? I've got to kill this day somehow. <laughs> That's the first thing I want to ask you, Andy, is, is this current historical event that we're living in, which has resulted in a lot of people being indoors, is that an ideal scenario for you as a writer or do you kind of get as smothered as everyone else with the, you know, with the news cycle? No, I th- it is an ideal scenario yep. for a writer. In yep. fact, I was joking with my wife, Jill, an editor. We've been preparing for lockdown all our lives. We've got a <laughs> library full of books we, we still haven't made a dent in, and I certainly had a lot of deadlines to catch up on, which um, I've almost caught up now that we've had 18 months <laughs> of it. I think I'm almost breathing easy for the first time in many decades now, you came from, uh, you, you were an educator, a teacher. Early part of your career, you were doing both, teaching English and writing these books. Did you yep. find uh, you were able to impart things on, on the kids as an author that you p- probably couldn't do as, as a teacher? Was, was, was there an element of that in, you know, not only uh, teaching the curriculum, but also becoming a part of it? There was, although what I did just before becoming a teacher, I'd been in punk rock bands in Melbourne, like, you know, everyone. Yeah, I was just about to say that. It seems like everyone we speak to from... uh even the politicians, yeah, some of them have been the politicians, in Politicians, you know, yeah. apparently, what's his name, buddy? Uh, someone was in TISM or something. Yeah, yeah, we had one of the TISM guys <laughs> on the other day, yeah. yeah. And, 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 of course, you were truly, I mean, alternative rock was the term, but it was a, a gothic farmyard. Was that, was that the band there? That's correct. Yeah. You've done your research. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, the first half of the 80s was a real experimental time mm-hmm. for music in general and particularly in Melbourne where, you know, I've always put it down to the weather's not quite as nice yep. as up where you yep. are. So yep. we, we do spend a lot of time indoors, a little more interior, a little more depressed in some yep. ways, but that's kind of helpful for creativity because yep. you find ways to get out of that. Yep. So at that point, anyone could get up on a stage and do anything and find an appreciative audience. Especially and, uh, punk. Punk is conducive to that because yeah. it's very subjective, punk rock music. You could, uh, yeah. Some people might say it sounds like a bunch of screaming cats and some people might sound like it sounds like the voice of the youth. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, there was a lot of punk too in Queensland because, you know, back then- Of course. We were living under a dictatorship back <laughs> yeah, then, well, you know. You invented it with yeah. the, the Saints <laughs> and yeah. Stranded, yeah. Yeah, arguably yeah. one of the first uh, punk rock singles in the world. Yeah. Alongside Ramones and uh, the Sex Pistols, mm. it all just emerged yeah. at the right time. But yeah, a dictatorship helps. <laughs> so I was into it because I loved writing. Mm. I'd, I'd written words all through my life and, and writing parody songs, and I ended up as a singer. Although I prefer the term vocalist. Yep. And we would we would smash cans. It, well, it didn't sound like music half the time. It was just interesting noise. And uh, eventually I realised my limitations and I I thought it's the words I really, really love. So I got out of that, started writing seriously and practising my writing, fell into teaching. And for the first time I was in a, a remote country school teaching kids who didn't like reading 
who um, thought books were for losers mm -hmm. and, you know, the last thing you'd want to do. And I just thought they were making a terrible mistake. Yep. And I was quite subversive without trying to be subversive yeah. in that classroom because I'd come from Melbourne to a conservative uh, country town, mm. Miljura. Oh, um, yeah. I know, beautiful. I know it well. <laughs> you do? Yeah. yeah. How do you, what's your connection? Oh, you know, I've been around the traps, Andy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I've been up and <laughs> down that river time. a few times, yeah. It's almost, you can almost drive straight, like, true south from Batuta and you'll be in Mildura. Ah, oh, okay. Mm. <laughs> got it, got it. Mm. Totally exotic. It's like a, the sun's out all the time and uh, just an oasis. Yeah. And I found myself just talking normally and the kids would go, wow, we've never thought of that. Yeah. And I was like, oh. But I started writing stories for them the day my bum ran away. Yeah. And they went, this is great. Mm -hmm. Can we write something like that? And I was like, of course you can. <laughs> and so pretty soon we had this little self-publishing thing going on in the classroom where I, they would write silly, funny stories. I would photocopy them into little books in the in the photocopy room and, and distribute them around the school and say, look at that, you're now authors, you're connecting with other students, the other students want to do this now. So that's how my own writing sort of took off from a self-publishing empire based in the photocopy room at Mildura Secondary College. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Did you find with the, the curriculum for, particularly with young boys, the curriculum always involves some sort of book that might even make a young kid feel depressed about things, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. I always found that interesting that they make young people read books like The Outsiders and stuff like that where it's really, I mean, if you're a teenager or a young person going through stuff, you really want to read about the most depressed version of your life. And then, well, and then on the other on the other end of that, it's like it's either that or you're riding a dragon in some magical fantasy land. There was uh, there was nothing that fun for him. That's right. Mm. That was the big gap. That was the obvious gap that mm. was missing. And when I'd take them to the library for free reading, they'd mm. wander the shelves aimlessly, picking out books and checking out whether the type was very big. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was it was too small. And they put it back and I'd say, what are you looking for? And they're going, so, uh, something funny. Yeah. And I would try to help them find something funny, but there was precious little, except for, you know, Australia's funniest yarns, yeah. which <laughs> might have been funny 100 years ago. Yeah. Uh, the Loaded Dog by Henry Lawson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just about to say The Loaded Dog, yeah. <laughs> the loaded Dog. <laughs> Nothing against it, but yeah. it's not talking to those kids in no. late 80s, no. Ventura, no. No. who are already watching The Simpsons. Yeah. and watching movies and playing wild computer games where there's no limits on the imagination or ex expectation that they're going to be taught something of great value to them. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's my early reading experiences were all like that mm -hmm. and they are as much as I can now. They were wild adventures, yeah. romps, you know, yeah. escapism. Yeah. And while there is a place for the outsiders and certainly the catcher in the rye was, was my um, go-to in secondary school, although I'd argue there's a lot of humour leavening that, yeah. his, his existential crisis. So, yeah, that's what I, I just went, why is no one writing what I would call serious humour? Yeah. It's all kind of lame. Yeah. Or it's adults trying to get down with the kids yeah. and be funny. And you pick it and like the kids can pick it in yeah. 10 seconds. Yeah. But when I tried to improve my writing, I was trying to write seriously and I just could not do it. Yeah. The energy that came out was a young teenager, punk rocker, uh, who just wanted to mess things up yeah. and uh, be stupid. And <laughs> after a few years of trying desperately to be a proper writer, I went, no, nah, I can't do it. I've just got to give in to this stupidity. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's my thing. And I think the kids at that point realised, ah, oh, he's not trying to be funny. Yeah. He just is naturally left of centre and, and we're interested. Yeah. Do you find, uh, you know, after you've been doing it for a couple of decades now, do you find you meet writers, whether they be serious ones or, or you know, people doing similar stuff to what you did, can you see your influence or and do you ever hear from people that that would claim it? Uh, I do. And, um, apart from the Batuta um, advocate, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that is, 
Yeah, you get it. Yeah. And I suspect you get how much hard work there is yeah. in crafting humour. It's it's a deceptive art form because it's meant to look like you're just throwing it off the top of your head yeah. and being a smart ass. Um, yeah. But it actually, to get humour to work in print requires endless amounts of yeah. work and dedication and an inquiry into the craft of yeah. what you're doing and why. So, yeah, there are people who, who are influenced or say they are, but sometimes I wonder if they're really going deep enough yeah. to make it super funny. Yeah. Like I would, when I first encountered the books of Jeff Kinney, uh, Wimpy Kid series, mm-hmm. I was in US at the time in about 2008, and it was such a thrill because I went, oh, my God, someone else is, is yeah. mining the humour shaft Mm-hmm. in a really deep yeah. and profound way. Yeah, and he hit some gold, didn't he? I mean, like, that's just, he'd be making squillions off that now, wouldn't he? <laughs> oh, his book sales are in the hundreds of millions. Yeah, he's got um, movies and TV shows, yeah. mugs, T-shirts. Yeah, yeah, and he's mouse the nicest. Pads. Yeah. Yeah, and it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Yeah. He's, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's really what you want him to be. Yeah. And, and also he has the advantage of being able to draw as yeah. well as write, yeah. and that is one of the rarest combinations on the planet, although I think he looks at what me and Terry does yeah. and is a bit baffled and and would like to do that yeah. himself. So yeah, there are advantages to a partnership because the other one's throwing you curveballs all the time. Well, I, I was just about to ask, how did you go from working in a high school in the Sunraysia to meeting Terry? It's been a creative partnership that's you know spanned you know tens of books. It's yeah. How did it start? Well, I was in Sunraysia. And I was thinking, gee, I'd love to do this full time. I'd love to write full time. But like, that's a crazy dream. But I'm just going to put half my pay aside. And in a couple of years, I'll go yeah. leave without pay and I'll go back to Melbourne and like do it full time and take a writing course. And in the meantime, I was generating all these little bits and pieces for my classes. So there were dreams, like little sketch comedy, cartoons and and silly random ideas, not proper stories, just provocations. Mm. And uh, eventually an educational publisher saw the collection, said, oh, this would make a great creative writing textbook for other teachers. And I said, okay, but... Yeah, we'll just put the exercises at the bottom so it's like a collection of randomness. And they said, we'll get this guy, Terry Denton, to illustrate. Uh, He's got a good sense of humour. And so I didn't know him, but his picture, when it came back, that was called Swinging on the Clothesline, about how to to have fun destroying your parents' clothesline. Yeah, yeah. And he had the kids not only swinging on the clothesline but flying off into outer space. And I was like, perfect, you know, this, this guy gets me. And uh, he eventually helped me to get published the first Just book, Just Tricking. Uh, That was published four years later with him on board as the established part of the partnership because no one, none of the other publishers could understand what I was trying to do. Yeah. It's entertaining, but we can't see a market for this. (laughs) And I was like, well, I know one. They're right in my classroom right at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not on the ground with these kids in Mildura. Exactly. And also, as you would know, humour, when something new comes along, it takes a little while to learn the rules. You know, you watch a sitcom or a sketch show. Often it's not that funny the first time through. And then you watch the second one and you go, "Ah, okay, I get it. I know it's, oh, this is funny. And then you really fall in love. So I knew there would be resistance because what it appeared that I was doing in the Just Books was just, encouraging kids to embrace anarchy yep. and go out of control and be <laughs> rude and, and back chat and the whole bit. And I knew I wasn't mm-hmm. because I knew that was the job of the character in the story to do that. But that doesn't mean that a kid is going to automatically, robotically do that thing. Mm. And that was the big battle for the next few years calming librarians, teachers, booksellers, parents down that it's okay for stories to be out of control and silly yeah. because it's actually what we want as a reader, particularly a young one. So you kind of came through during quite a golden age for uh, you know young adult and children's authors. <laughs> you had your Gleitzmans and your Jennings as well running around. Maybe they were 
uh, targeted a bit, a bit older, earlier. a bit earlier, and probably mm. a bit older too, with their audience. But uh, you look back at that era and think we really had found a voice. So we really had found a, particularly with Australian the cultural identity as well. It, you kind of had gotten to the point where you knew how to write for Australian kids too. And I'm sure your books have translated elsewhere in the world, but but it took a while for, for adults to understand kids in this country. Exactly. Mm. And it took, it was certainly an Australian voice. Yeah. In fact, I, had, I did have to go back to the Just Tricking last year and kind of rewrite it yeah. for the modern era because mm. there were so many anachronisms and I, I think I said the word bloody and mm. hell, yeah. which yeah. I would never do now but seemed quite normal yeah. and what I needed to do at that time. Yeah. But now it was coming across quite harsh. And so my nowadays were- you'd say frickin'. <laughs> freak, freak, fr- uh, no, no, I wouldn't say freaking. That's already dated. Well, it's interesting though because the world, if anything, has gotten in terms of that stuff. It's gotten more open and you know less conservative about what you can and can't say. But at the same time, you've got to really watch what you write and watch what you say now much more than what you did in the mid nineties. That's correct. Yeah. yeah, it was it was incendiary even back then yeah. what I was doing. Yeah, yeah, but you could push it through. Yeah. Just to, as a side note, nothing I wrote was was translated or published with any success until the Treehouse series in okay. two thousand overseas. Right. Yeah. Until two thousand and eleven, two thousand and twelve. And we actually wrote that because we just gave up on ever thinking an overseas audience would understand yeah. Yeah. our Australian knockabout humour. Yeah. But Treehouse is, has had all the no- sharp edges and rough edges knocked off it. It's, okay. it's just anarchy, but only about 10%, yeah. whereas <laughs> the Just Books were 80% anarchy, <laughs> which works for, for readers like you, yeah. but not for everyone. It's yeah. a bit too thrashy, punk rock thrashy. Yeah, yeah. And so by the time we got to Treehouse, we'd got a lot of stuff out of our system yeah. and we were going, hey, let's let's try a story where everything isn't going out of control all of the time. <laughs> yeah. That would be radical. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that's how we connected with an even younger audience and a bigger audience and uh, many overseas publishers suddenly understood what we were doing. That's a very Australian format that doesn't translate overseas is the idea of plugging holes as they open up and then, you know, you finish the story with a anticlimax, you know what I mean? Or, or you go, you've got another disaster that you finish with. Yeah. Like the, the, a great example is the TV show Rake. Australians love Rake and they tried to make it in America with Greg Kinnear, but just didn't work it didn't work because americans need that blazing glory at the end of a at the end of an episode which you just don't get with australian humor it's like right. yeah he's gone yeah. he's stuffed up again oh we'll wait till next episode to see Let's, to see how he gets out of this one kind of like what they did too with the uh in-betweeners in england how that's like very dry english humor and they tried to put it into an american context and it was just probably the, the worst thing that anyone has ever paid to produce in the his- in the history of television. <laughs> it just that's, that's a big claim. <laughs> it's un uh, <laughs> from the people that brought us reality TV. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, it, cross cross yeah. cultural humour is is one of the hot, biggest high wire, most dangerous acts yeah. you can engage in. I mean, it worked for The Office yeah. uh, from UK to. US. Yeah. And they worked hard on that too. They made that work. And, uh, it, you know, it was just integral that they had the same kind of talent in, in England, in America as well. Um, but you're, yeah. you're dealing with the best of the best in that circumstance too with with television. But you, you, you say you found your way with the Treehouse series over there. Another question I want to ask is, and we don't like it, the political correctness, people can talk about this all they want, but at the end of the day, you realize it's quite. Uh, you know, at least in our experience, it's much more of an idea than it is an actual concept. It's um, it's something that people limit themselves with uh, a lot yep. of the time. But how did you find that line? You know what I mean? Because it's one thing. Th- there's a line that would have been just a bigger part of your job as the actual writing is figuring out that line. Like you called it the day my bum went psycho, but yep. you could have called it the day my asshole went. You know what I mean? You could have called it the day my arsehole went absolutely oh. fucking bananas. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, well, I did consider that, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) No, bum was just the right degree of rudeness. It was a soft, rude word. I, you know, it was. It didn't seem terribly harmful, but in the very highly conservative world of children's literature in Australia at that point, it was just rude enough to get people's attention. Yeah. And that was exactly what I wanted to do, yeah. to try to, you know, ram a bit more freedom through yeah. for, for everyone to relax and realise that books can be fun and silly and chaotic as well as your outsiders and, and books that uh, have a more overt message. But we need, we need a wide reading palette mm-hmm. and um, to attract the biggest possible cache of readers. So... It just felt rude, but not ridiculous. Um, <laughs> yeah. Did you did you relish in your your status as the bad boy of children's literature? I loved it. It was <laughs> felt totally <laughs> punk rock. It was like, look. Yeah. Um, I think I never uh, said I was a role model. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, "Oh, come on!" Yeah. And I think at the time I was helped enormously. We'd had four just books out. Yeah. Tricking, annoying, stupid, disgusting, you know, crazy. So that it was getting increasingly out of control as yeah. we we got confident, and the kids were egging us on, and we're <laughs> yeah. going, okay, okay. <laughs> and then I said, Let, I, I could use this platform because a lot of librarians were saying, look, I had to take your books out of the library because a parent complained yeah. that their kid came home with it, and I said, well, why should the whole school suffer because one parent? complaints and they mm. go well we don't you know just want a quiet life and i said no your job <laughs> is to make sure all kids have reading yeah. material so that really angered me and i said i'm going to write this book with a ridiculous title and force you all to say bum over and over again yeah. until it becomes normal and we can all get on with our lives yeah. so that was its purpose and it got banned i was the reading ambassador for a reading campaign and I think the federal education minister at the time banned that book cover from being on the poster. Oh, right. And um, the Pan Macmillan publicist at the time, Jane Novak, rang me up, said, uh, guess what? And uh, she said, your book's been banned. And I said, is that good or bad? She said, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. and, and I was on the page page three of The Age the next yeah. day. And so it took it into a whole other realm. Yeah. After a while, it did get tedious mm-hmm. because oh, actually we went back for another serve with um, the bad book and mm-hmm. the very bad book which were cautionary tales gone mad. Yeah. Everyone was bad and everything was bad and it was chaos. <laughs> and a lot of that attracted another round of sort of hate from yeah. you know, particularly even conservative radio DJs. Oh, yeah. So you're encouraging kids to set fire to cats. <laughs> and I was going, oh, I am not. You know, <laughs> Can you just read this yeah. a little more yeah. carefully? No. And so, <laughs> I did eventually tire of five or six years of notoriety. Yeah. And that's when we started exploring other areas. Yeah. But yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> and uh to get back to an earlier question you asked, there are, there is a sort of bum literature now yeah. which claims me as a uh, as a inspiration. Yeah, okay. Yeah. The, the- which, and sometimes it's funny and sometimes I'm not very <laughs> proud. <laughs> <laughs> So writers often talk about, I mean, writers don't like talking about it, but people who talk about writers like to talk about writer's block. But what they don't also talk about is when you're hitting your straps, which, um, you know, we've we've done a, 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 we've published a few books in the shape with Batuta and, you know, yeah. in, in the same format as the actual website. And that we wouldn't be able to uh, claim either because it's basically, you know, a best of each year kind of thing. Yeah. But there were times where you were, you had, how many projects on the go where you were absolutely ripping, you were creatively, you were just, you know, it was like hitting the perfect golf ball. When do you think that was, or, or if it isn't lockdown, when, when do you think you found yourself actually in full flight as a writer? Oh, it's been a long, a long flight, really. Yeah. Uh, it took 10 years from, from Sunraysia to publication of Just Tricking 
to kind of figure out how to be completely comfortable and my own voice and to get the effect I wanted. So I did take 10 years of experimenting. And then just tricking is a tentative step. And then just annoying is where it hits. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of figure out what I'm doing. And then it was just extending it each year to the point of incorporating Terry more. Yep. Uh, yeah. That became that was the point of the bad books to get us to write together in a room, making each other laugh and coming up with it at the point rather than me doing something and him illustrating later. So yeah, well, look, we've had such a great throughout the two thousands. We were just putting out experimental books: yeah. the cat on the mat is flat. What bummer saw is that? What body part is that? Just yeah. mad books, and that's how we eventually hit the treehouse series which was just another experimental book and since then it does take us roughly a year to write each book yep. so it's a slow motion yeah. kind of hitting the straps because <laughs> you can back at any point and f if something's not working uh, you can fix it and so yeah i do need a long time to, to figure them out now terry and you as you said before 33 best-selling books between you uh, together could we have the same conversation with him? You know, he's. This is what he's doing. Like, is is he doing anything else, or is it you? You're basically working on each project together and have done for these last couple of decades. Yeah, we we love working together, and he yeah. calls us like brothers, yeah. brothers in stupidity. Yeah. When I came along, he realised as a writer, I could offer him places to go yeah. that were more wild and free yeah. than anything else he was being offered. And in the same way, when he illustrates my stuff, it excites me and inspires me to write new stuff to yeah. kind of lift to his standard. And that's that's how we work. One offers something, the other improves it, the other tops that. And so that's a real joy. He has other sides to him, though. <laughs> I've, I've only got <laughs> stupidity and um, obnoxiousness. Whereas he does beautiful watercolour picture books yep. and paints. Yeah. He's, a, he's a great painter. Yeah. So he, he explores other areas and he would probably say, oh, this, this is kind of Andy's show, even though he's very much, I couldn't do it without him. Has, he ever, fact, pulled you up? Has he ever pulled you up and said, Andy, really? <laughs> what are we doing here? Where are we going? And, uh, or is he, is he very much on your level as, as a brother in stupidity? He's he's almost ninety nine percent of the time on my <laughs> on my level. I think we did a book last year, one hundred and thirty story treehouse, where I because I grew up reading horror comics yeah. and science Twilight yeah. Zone science fiction like stuff, H.P. Lovecraft stuff. Oh, it was totally influenced by that. Yeah, uh, by Ray Bradbury. Yeah, um, yeah. Pre code American horror comics uh, mm -hmm. is my is my joy, my secret shame and my joy. <laughs> my vice. <laughs> Bef before they even regulated them in the early 50s, mm -hmm. those, that industry was out of control and they were just going anywhere. <laughs> and it's that jumping in and wonderful period and I take endless inspiration from that. <laughs> and so I had the idea, oh, wouldn't it be funny if a giant flying eyeball uh, sucked the treehouse up along with Andy, Terry and Jill and took them to Iborlia yeah. and, um, you know, we had an intergalactic space adventure. And, yeah, he didn't quite seem to enjoy drawing the flying eyeballs yeah. or the blobs uh, <laughs> on Blobdromeda. And so I had to ask for quite a few redraws and I think he was getting a little... Um, over it at that point <laughs> so, so the uh the forthcoming book is is a nice camping adventure in yeah. the treehouse yeah yeah, yeah. So. so that's 143 it's 143 story treehouse out now or, or coming out now uh coming out in october the 19th okay so it, it'll be out in time for the christmas stockings as well for all the uh, that's for all the parents out there listening in you, you said this is more of a bit less horror core <laughs> yeah, I, even Jill uh, got got sick of it. I said, oh, I don't get all this stuff. And I said, don't worry, there's plenty of kids like me out there who will. And it's the 11th, 130 was the 10th book. Yep. So each book we try to do something that we haven't done before. Yeah. So it's it's got to go somewhere different mm -hmm. and you jump through other hoops. 
and I must say what Terry did ultimately was just amazing. He, mm. he brought Ibolia and Blob Drometer to life. And yeah. Total success in my eyes. But I promised them both we would just do a nice domestic adventure, yeah. uh, not quite so much action epic. Now, you talk a lot over the years. I'm not sure this is not your number one cause, but you have mentioned, uh, you know, the the cotton wool wrapped kids that we, we are seeing from time to time. You know, trampolines now have yeah. nets around them. And and <laughs> a scooter now has two tyres up the front so the kids don't fall off. Yeah. You yeah. Know? <laughs> you know? and, like, and they're not even allowed to play with firearms down the back shooting cans anymore. You no, know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, or birds. <laughs> or, yeah. or birds or, or roos. Or stray cats, um, stray cats. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. It is an interesting thing that you would have seen in your, um, you know, throughout your career when the early days. These, these kids in, I'm sure these kids in Mildura had had slingshots in their back pocket. Shanghai, as they were called back yeah. then. You know, and they were probably shooting yeah. ball bearings at passing cars. And now, <laughs> and now the kids aren't aren't doing that kind of stuff. And there, there is an element of obviously safety is important, but also so is those are. Uh, those different lessons you learn along the way. Is that something you still kind of feel and, and has the internet only kind of uh, boosted that, that kind of uh, protection racket around the kids? Yeah, I, it's really hard. I, for a long time I was on that. Yeah. We need to relax yeah. um, the restrictions on kids and, and calm our own fears yeah. about what might be out there. But uh, I'm just searching for his name. The uh, ABC broadcaster and author uh, wrote the book The Land Before Avocado about growing up in Australia. Um, he's, yeah. he's a very famous uh, ABC yeah, yeah. writer, Richard. But he just cautioned on that, look, history is written by the survivors. The, the kids didn't, some kids didn't survive the 70s. It wasn't through enlightened parenting we yeah. were all running around with those things. Yeah. It was partly through neglect. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I wouldn't want to go completely back to the days of the Wild West. Yeah, but, yeah, for sure. No seat belts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but in some ways what I am more concerned about is that kids are allowed to have free unstructured time that's not filled up with adult directed activities. Yeah. I, yeah. I think if you go back to the, my childhood in the 70s, that was a major characteristic. Mm -hmm. They they weren't trying to make you a, education was important, but it yeah. wasn't the be all and end all. Yeah. They didn't feel it was their job to keep me entertained. Yeah. I had to we made our own fun. Yeah. And that doesn't have to be dangerous fun. Yeah. And I think if the lockdown if there is one benefit of uh, a thousand days in lockdown it has been one of them is the discovery of simple pleasures again yeah, yeah. the bike paths the walking paths mm -hmm. outside our house are absolutely full again and the sheer joy for both mum and dad and the kids for the kid to leave the house for an hour by exactly. himself or by herself exactly. yeah 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 that was taken for granted yeah. before this because we could do it all inside yeah and, you know, another thing that I think has contributed to my longevity as a writer is that I'm a physical fitness yep. enthusiast, yep. have been since the age of 10. What are we talking? Are we talking cyclist? Cycling, running, circuit training, yeah, right. uh, swimming, you name it, I'll, yeah. I'll throw myself at it. But I think there's a lot of research coming out now to show that has a tremendously helpful effect on, on our moods, on our brains, on our creativity, uh, on imagination. So that just getting out and moving is good. It doesn't have to be riding a, a billy cart with three wheels down a really steep hill yeah. uh, towards a brick wall. Yeah. It's the movement that's important. That is the thing. It's, you, you can get caught up in this like misplaced nostalgia about the good old days, but Everyone yeah. in those when we're talking about that, we we tend to neglect the scary priests and the and the belt that would come out when you get in trouble and that kind exactly. of stuff. Exactly, you know. Um, yeah. But then again, it is also great for kids to run around for two hours until they are absolutely out of steam. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You do see a lot of that in lockdown. You see some poor bloke taking the kids to the park and just kicking a football as far as he can, making them run it back, do it again, <laughs> go home so you can you know go, go yeah. to sleep. <laughs> No, I really feel for kids with for parents with young kids. Yeah. I think it must have been really, really tough. Mm. Yeah, that was my go-to with my daughters. Yeah. Go to the park. And, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> well, you're still at it, and um, and we're very we're very excited that um, you know the, the the kids today still have access to the Andy Griffiths that the kids for now yeah. decades have had. So. Um, 143 tree houses out back into this month and uh, yeah it's a it's a real treat for any bookworms and any kids that you reckon could be a bookworm if given you know something that piqued their interest completely and uh, yeah the what I, what I would say just to finish would be the imagination is one of the unregulated wild spaces so yeah. you can, you can go to dangerous places and imagine dangerous things and I think that's tremendously important so come to the treehouse pat the uh sharks in the the man-eating sharks in the uh shark tank without a fence (laughs) throw bowling balls around don't worry if they hit anyone down the bottom yeah and have marshmallows for dinner from the marshmallow machine (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's it's uh it's 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 great stuff and and as as we said before it's um there's a consistent stream and 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 you and terry are going to Keep uh, keep giving the kids these kind of stories and give them uh, uh, help them expand their imagination like that. So thank you for joining us today, Andy Griffiths. It's been an honour to chat to you. It's been an honour to chat to you too. You're my favourite uh, source of news. In fact, you're my only source of news. <laughs> it's good to hear. Thanks, thanks, Andy. Thanks, Andy. Thank you very much.